Johnston McCulley's first Zorro story, The Curse of Capistrano, was published as a serial in All Story Weekly beginning on August 9th, 1919. It tells the story of the dissolute Don Diego Vega and his alter ego, Zorro, The Curse of Capistrano. It is set in Los Angeles sometime after the Mexican Secularization Act of 1833, when the California missions were effectively disestablished. With a loyal band of followers, caballeros, Zorro defends the defenseless and wronged friars, restores a nobleman to his rightful status, and rescues a beautiful girl from the clutches of the evil Captain Ramon, Comandante of the Presidio whom he then kills in a sword fight after first carving a Z, the mark of Zorro, on his forehead. Like the tongue of a serpent, Signor Zorro's blade shot in. Thrice it darted forward, and upon the fair brow of Ramon, just between the eyes, there flamed suddenly a red, bloody letter Z, the mark of Zorro. And of course he gets the girl. Within a year, Douglas Fairbanks bought the movie rights and produced the silent film, The Mark of Zorro. Over the next few decades, Macaulay wrote over 60 Zorro stories, and a dozen American feature films were produced. Those of us of a certain age remember Walt Disney's Zorro TV show from the late 1950s. This talk focuses on the first Zorro story, The Curse of Capistrano. The literary and quasi-historical antecedents of Zorro are well documented. Among the literary antecedents are the Scarlet Pimpernel, with its double identity foppish hero and his devoted band of followers rescuing the persecuted aristocrats of revolutionary France. The traditional tales and ballads of Robin Hood, again with a devoted band of followers opposing the nefarious Sheriff of Nottingham and rescuing Maid Marian from his evil clutches. Helen Hunt Jackson's 1884 novel, Ramona, presented old California in myth and legend, lamented the persecution and destruction of the Franciscan missions and the noble friars that preserved them, and upheld the dignity and rights of the indigenous people of Southern California. The most famous of Zorro's presumed historical antecedents is Joaquin Murrieta, documented by John Rollin Ridge in 1854, and republished in many versions, both as pulp fiction and as legitimate history, throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Murrieta, originally from Mexico, was a miner at the time of the American conquest and set out with a band of devoted followers to avenge the wrongs he and other noble Mexicans had suffered at the hands of the American interlopers. This paper proposes that, in addition to these literary predecessors, Johnston McCulley's Zorro was inspired by California's Mission Revival architectural movement of the early 20th century, as epitomized by Riverside, California's Mission Inn, designed by Arthur Benton, who was born in Peoria, Illinois, and trained at the School of Art and Design in Topeka, Kansas. The Spanish missions of California are a chain of 21 religious outposts or missions established between 1769 and the early 1800s along what came to be called the Camino Real from San Diego to Sonoma. The missions were founded by Catholic priests of the Franciscan order to evangelize the Native Americans and consolidate Spain's territorial holdings. In 1821, Mexico achieved independence from Spain taking California along with it, but the missions maintained authority over native communities and control of land holdings until the 1820s. The California government secularized the missions with the passage of the Mexican Secularization Act of 1833. The surviving mission buildings are the state's oldest structures and its most visited historic monuments. They have become a symbol of California, appearing in many movies and television shows. These missions are the inspiration for Mission Revival architecture. In his introduction to a 1955 reissue of the Joaquin Murrieta story, Joseph Henry Jackson notes that, as the first two decades of the 20th century wore along, Californians began to become newly conscious of their past. Some of the old Franciscan missions were restored. 
There were land booms and railway promotions, and the tourist trade burgeoned. Suddenly, Californians were hunting for every hint of romance in their past. This mission nostalgia was fueled by Charles Fletcher Lummis's periodical, The Land of Sunshine, published between 1894 and 1923. Lummis himself was born in Massachusetts and came to Los Angeles from Cincinnati, Ohio. From early on, this magazine featured ads for the Landmarks Club, of which Lummis was president. The goal of this organization was to conserve the missions and other historic landmarks of Southern California. Most issues of the Land of Sunshine included historical essays recounting mission history, and many included essays by Lummis advocating both the restoration and preservation of the physical missions and the aptness of traditional building materials such as adobe for Southern California architecture. As evidenced by picture postcards from the early 20th century, nostalgia for the mission period provided a basis for promoters' appeals. Here we see some of the architectural elements that would become hallmarks of the mission revival style. Red tile roof, arches, and bell towers. Recognizing the romantic appeal and sentimental value of the missions, California's civic leaders, promoters, and architects began designing and building public and private buildings in a supposed authentic mission style, with picture postcards again used to promote tourism, immigration, and investment. As suggested by Jackson, Railway, real estate developers, and promoters of all stripes adopted the mission story to publicize Southern California to tourists, businesses, and immigrants. Remarkably, as noted by David Gephardt in his 1967 article on the Spanish colonial revival in Southern California, unquestionably, one of the unique qualities of this regional architecture is that it had little, if any, real roots in the historic past of the area. The Spanish colonial revival from its mission phase on was almost totally a myth created by newcomers to the area. The civic leaders, the promoters, the architects, Lummis, Benton, Burnham, all were from the East or Midwest, not native Californians. One of these newcomers was Johnston McCulley, the creator of Zorro. Born in Illinois in 1883, McCulley was an itinerant newspaper man, pulp fiction author, and screenwriter. McCulley's first documented visit to Southern California was in 1908, when he visited San Diego to secure local color for one of his serialized pulp stories. In his interview with the San Diego Union, McCulley noted that, San Diego has two virtues. It is one of the most beautiful places in the country, and it teems with romance. There is romance in every sparkle of the ocean off Coronado, in the distant hills, in such places as Old Town and Lakeside and Dulzura. During McCulley's 1908 visit to San Diego, the biggest tourist attractions were the marriage place of Ramona, a disintegrating hacienda with Spanish red tile roof, veranda, and careta, and the recently restored Mission San Diego de Acala. Indeed, McCulley's first foray into California's mythic history was Captain Fly-By-Night, a stirring romance of California in the early days, published as a serial in All Story Weekly beginning May 27, 1916. The novel is set in San Diego just after Mexican independence from Spain, but before the disestablishment of the missions. As with Zorro in The Curse of Capistrano, the story involves dual and mistaken identity, the rescue of a beautiful maiden, and the ultimate destruction of a villain. As a writer of pulp fiction, Macaulay emphasized dialogue and action narrative, with very little by way of scenic description. Indeed, the two most descriptive passages in Captain Fly-By-Night are, the mission buildings formed three sides of a square. The fourth side was an adobe wall, nearly 10 feet tall. There is no description of the mission buildings, here or anywhere else. In the distance, the buildings of the rancho could be seen, white against a green background. There is no further description of the rancho buildings, with the exception that a patio with a fountain is later mentioned. Sometime between May 1908 and October 1912, 
Macaulay found himself a job as the night editor of the Los Angeles Tribune. He was named managing editor of the Riverside Independent Enterprise on October 28, 1912, though he had been contributing to that paper since at least early October. Riverside, California was at that time the hub of the mission revival style and the nostalgia which it represented. In addition to the Riverside Public Library, which we've already seen, there were the Carnegie Library, the San Pedro, Los Angeles, and Salt Lake Railroad Depot, and topping them all, Frank Miller's Mission Inn. In nearby San Gabriel Mission, California's Mission Play, based very loosely on Ramona, was first produced in 1912, advertised as an American Oberammergau. Six years after leaving Riverside, three years after writing Captain Fly by Night, Macaulay published The Curse of Capistrano, Zorro's debut. As in Captain Fly by Night, the writing is propelled by dialogue and action narrative. The most specific scenic description is found in the opening sentence. Again the sheet of rain beat against the roof of red Spanish tile, and the wind shrieked like a soul in torment, and smoked puff from the big fireplace as the sparks were showered on the hard dirt floor. Instead of description, Macaulay relies on simple nouns to convey the time and place. The story takes place in the town of Los Angeles, which is always called a Pueblo. In outlying ranches and ranch houses, which are always called ranchos and haciendas. Every hacienda has a veranda, but this veranda is never described. It is simply a place where dialogue and action can occur and at the Presidio or Fort, which Los Angeles certainly did not possess. Perhaps it was imported from San Diego, which did have a Presidio. There are no arches, no bell towers, and except for that opening sentence, no roofs of red Spanish tile. The hallmarks of Mission Revival are never mentioned. The protagonists are gentlemen, always called caballeros. The women are always senoras or senoritas. The villain, Captain Ramon of the Presidio, is the Comandante. The Franciscan friars are known collectively as frailes, individually as fray. By this vocabulary does Macaulay inform his readers that they are in California's romantic early days. But Macaulay does allude indirectly to the Mission Revival movement with its attendant romanticism, sentimentality, and nostalgia in a speech given by Fray Felipe. The sainted Junipero Cerro invaded this land when other men feared, and at San Diego de Alcala he built the first mission of what became a chain, thus giving an empire to the world. The mission empire is doomed, caballero. The time is not far distant when mission roofs will fall in and the walls crumble away. Some day people will look at the ruins and wonder how such a thing could come to pass. And it is certainly this romantic spirit deriving from the mission revival movement that provided at least some of the inspiration for Johnston McCulley's first Zorro story, The Curse of Capistrano. In her 2008 article, The Mark of Zorro, Silent Film's Impact on 1920s Architecture in Los Angeles, Mary Ovnek argued that the conventions of silent film influenced the interior design of many Mission Revival houses in Los Angeles. I would suggest that this influence was a two-way street, with the essential romanticism of the Mission Revival architectural movement influencing at least Pulp Fiction in the 19-teens via Zorro.